Well, glory, glory to God for everything that we are celebrating. When you grab your copy of the strategic plan after church and you read through it this week, you'll see more praise updates because it's the original plan along with a few highlights that we put in there. It's not a comprehensive rundown, but there's a few notes in blue that just show you some of the things that have changed and have been accomplished. And then after the service today, we're going to ask our members and regular attenders to stay just for 10 minutes because we've got a few formal updates on the business, on the assimilation attendance, on the building. So Jim Timolinski is going to share, Julie is going to share, Brian Horner. So we have a few more just for kind of the congregation right after church, just about 10 minutes. And we'll give you some time uh, in the framework so that uh, that'll be built into the service. Well, what do you preach on when you're at a key milestone in a church? At the 500-day mark, we are going to go to Philippians 2, 12 to 18. For a Vision Sunday, going to Philippians 2, 12 to 18 perfectly captures the heart of God for his church because it's the Apostle Paul's appeal to this church he loved with a balanced look at who we're becoming in here and how we're reaching the world out there. From the beginning, that has been the fundamental breakdown in our vision. We have wanted to both hit the in here parts of the scripture and the out there. It's very hard to do both as a congregation. It's very hard to both succeed internally on becoming the church God wants you to become and externally on reaching the world. Usually you're good at one or the other. Hard to do both. I love that this passage in Philippians 2 reaches both of those priorities. The bottom line in this passage, which has a pretty famous verse in it, is that we are to become like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. We are to become like shining stars or a shooting star to a dark world that desperately needs the light of the gospel. In order to be that, we have to become the light in here before we export it. Amen? If we're not getting it right in here, we shouldn't go out there because we're only going to cause trouble. And I love that thought of being a shining star or a shooting star. There was uh, a girl who just had her phone out, uh, and she was with her friends, and she caught a viral video of a shooting star. Check it out. This is what she caught on her phone. Millions and millions and millions of people have seen that. She's just out living at night with some friends and suddenly she looks up. The whole, the whole, the whole night sky is ignited with, with glory and she can't believe her eyes. That's a picture, church, of what our impact on the world is supposed to be for Jesus Christ. We are supposed to be like stars shining in the universe in a dark generation that desperately needs the hope of Jesus Christ. That picture is what we are going for together. Now here's a map of how the Apostle Paul got to Philippi. We went through Acts last year, and you'll be happy to know that I've got my laser pointer out again. And so there on the second missionary journey, he started in Jerusalem, and then he went up and, you know, passed through. Remember he had like hundreds of miles of no, 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 and then Boom, he went over into this area, Thessalonica, Macedonia, Berea. That's where, that's where he reached Philippi. So this church was on his nice list. Corinth was on his naughty list. Philippi has always been on his nice list. Paul loves this church. They've always been faithful to him. This letter in Philippians was written as a thank you because they sent him support while Paul was in jail. Okay, so that sets up the whole sermon today. Let's pray and then we'll get into the passage together. Father in heaven, you are glorious. Jesus, you are on the throne. We seek to make your name known through our efforts to witness, O oh God. That starts when we are pressing on, O oh Lord, to become the disciples that you have designed us to be. Help us as we recommit ourselves to the vision you've given us here. Help us, Lord, to see the Great Commission today and our part to play in it. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Okay, so in Philippians 2, verse 18, it says this, uh, Philippians 2, 12 to 18. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. 
that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run or in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, the first thing you can write down in your notes is this. In here, in here we are becoming a holy, healthy, and humble spiritual community. It's the first half of our vision, and the first part of Paul's passage talks about in here. What kind of a church should we become? The heart of Paul, which reflects the pastor's heart he has for them, is for God's people to pursue spiritual progress together. Now, you notice that he says here, Therefore, my beloved, verse 12, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Now, if you're a parent, you like it when your kids obey when you're around. But when you're not around, that's when you really want them to obey. Am I right? So not only in my presence, but in my absence, when you leave them with the babysitter or send them off to school pretty soon, listen, obey your teacher. Listen, listen to the babysitter. Parents know what it feels like to want your children's to, children to obey when you're not around. Am I right, parents? Not only in my presence, but also in my absence. Pastors feel the same way. Paul is in jail. He can't go there and help them at all. So he's like, not only in my presence, but now in my absence, please live this out. It's wonderful on Sunday to see all of your smiling faces, to hear updates on your life. I love it, but anyone can behave at church, am I right? I want tomorrow when you're at work, in my absence, for you to be living out your salvation, right? Not just one day a week, but all the days. You can see the heart of Paul, you can see the heart of God. This permeates the book. If you glance at chapter 1, verse 6, his heart, his purpose says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He's confident in the work God's doing in them. Look at verse 8 of chapter 1. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ." filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What a vision he has for who the church is becoming as they gather. That's where our vision has come from. Who are we becoming? We want to become a holy, a healthy, a humble spiritual community. Those three yearnings are found in this passage here. And it's not just the heart of Paul, it's the heart of God that we're reading of. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. Paul said, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and being of one mind. In here, the kind of church we're becoming, God is yearning for us to become a church full of his love, full of his joy, full of his glory. Is that the kind of church you want to become? You want to build? Oh, it's not assembled. When you go to Ikea, you don't leave with a couch, you leave with a box. All assembly is required. When you come to a church, it is in progress. And the heart of God is for us to become the kind of church he has designed us to be. We have to have a vision for who we're becoming in here. And the church in Philippi is getting high marks. Maybe it's become the, because this city was established as a Roman colony and devoted to those who had served in the military. This was a military retirement town. So all these Roman soldiers showed up and they know duty, they know order, they know commitment, they're not afraid. So this church is just like, check, we got it, we're getting after it. Maybe that's why they are lockstep, getting high marks. But let's focus in on our three words that we've committed to. We want to become a holy healthy and humble spiritual community, because they show up in here. What does it mean to be a holy church? It says here, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You, of course, know you don't work for your salvation. Amen? 
You, of course, know this, right? You don't get saved by your own work. Salvation, the word itself, means to be saved, meaning someone saved you other than yourself. The very word itself contradicts self-effort. So holiness begins when you have been saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, are you a saved person? If Jesus has saved your soul, you have been made holy. If you're not a saved person, despite your best works, you are not holy before a holy God. A good way to think about it is this. I've got a prop here, okay? So this is a, a DeWalt drill, and if I wanted to get something done, and I was really wanting to get it done, I planned it out, I've got the whole project ready, I grab my drum, assembling something, and then it's worthless without what? Without power. And this is you trying your best without the Lord Jesus Christ. Your works don't work. Well, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, this is a pretty good drill. It's not going to work without the energizing power of the Holy Spirit, which you can only access through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, once you are saved, God gives you power to be transformed. You are saved. This is you when the Lord Jesus Christ saves your soul. Without Christ, it doesn't matter what you're trying to do. Your works don't work. Are you saved? You're either saved or you're not. It's not a multiple choice answer. Salvation makes you holy. Holiness begins in the church when we have saved people gathering. If we gathered as a church to just try and level up each week and work our own way into God's favor, what a failure that would be. That's not a holy church. That's a haughty church. Trying to flaunt our own righteousness before each other. Showing off, putting on a show. Look at how great I am. Holiness begins when we know we're saved. So it says here in verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This whole passage emanates from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32 and 33. Paul likely was reading that in his quiet time in jail. Because this passage springs out of Deuteronomy 32, 33, which is Moses led the people out of Egypt by the power of God. And in Deuteronomy 32, 33, they're about to go into the promised land after 40 years of being in the penalty box. Remember that? Because a bunch of knuckleheads came back to spies. They're like, we can't go in. They're so scary. 40 years in the penalty box. Moses is about to die, and he gives the Israelites this great commission. That's, that's the, Paul thinks he's going to die in jail. He's got to give them this commission because he doesn't think he's going to make it out of prison alive. So when you know that, you can sense the gravity of this word salvation. Here's a picture of the salvation through, uh, go to the next picture, Moses, and then we'll come back to this one. There's a picture of the salvation of God, Moses, leading God's people through the Red Sea, the waters of death, and then ending up on the other side. Pharaoh and his army was destroyed. This is a picture of what Jesus does for you. He saves you. Then on the other side, here's Mount Sinai on fire. Go up, there you go to that one, there we go. Mount Sinai is on fire as the Ten Commandments are being handed down to Moses from heaven. This is why we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Because what happens if you even touch the mountain? What happened? You died. This is salvation, my friends. God leads you out of slavery into the land of promise. Paul's writing about this. Go ahead and put that other picture up from jail in Rome. He's, in, he's somewhere in there in the slammer and he thinks he's going to die. So he's giving them this commission saying, be a holy church. Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. Are you saved? Does the gravity of that salvation come into church with you every Sunday? Church, we need to be holy. We need to work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that God's a puppeteer. It means that the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the person who's saved. So you are being transformed from one degree of glory to another once you're saved. 
Don't get this backwards. Life is not you stepping up one degree of goodness to another, and then in the end God decides if you're good enough to get into heaven. Nope. You're saved in an instant. Head to toe, made brand new. Then the Holy Spirit is within you, become a temple of God. He transforms you. That's called sanctification. That's what's being described here. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. That's also the Word of God that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. When you hear the Bible, you're not like, this again. Why did my mom drag me to church? Boring! Friends, if that's your heart, God's not likely working in you. You might not be saved. Because the saved come to be changed by the Word of God. That's what church is all about. God is working in you. Now that creates humility. We want to be a holy church, we're saved, and a humble church, God's doing the work and getting all the glory, amen? amen? You want to be a part of a humble church, am I right? Where God's doing all the work and God's getting all the glory, amen? God is working in you individually and corporately to will and to work according to his good pleasure. He gets all the glory in that. We want to be a humble church. God is a consuming fire, and his judgments fell on the Israelites when they stubbornly refused to follow him. We don't want to be that. We want to be humble. I read a quote from a French Renaissance philosopher. Don't ask me where I found it, but it caught my attention. He's from the 1500s. His name is Michel du Montaigne. But in the 1500s, he said something that I still know to be true. He said this, I have never seen a greater monster or miracle than myself. I have never seen a greater monster or miracle than myself. That should be said of every Christian. We're saved by grace, through faith. I have never seen a greater monster or miracle than myself. That's humbling, friends. That's humbling humbling when you realize you've been saved by a holy God who is transforming you every day. We want to be holy. We want to be humble. That means that we're working out our salvation. What does that mean? Well, we have four W's here at Anchor. Worship, walk, work, witness. When we are saved, we worship a holy God. Then we walk in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. And we learn to devote ourselves to good work. So our humility can be demonstrated through our worship, through our walk with Christ, and through our work for him. That's how we demonstrate our humility. And that shows up in every part of life. For it is God, verse 13, who works in you both to will and to act for his good pleasure. Hey, are you enjoying and experiencing and expressing the holiness that comes when God saves you? Are you also demonstrating humility that you've been saved and you want to serve other people? You want to show up and sing? You want to get into a group where you could grow with other people? Is humility being demonstrated in your life? Because if we want to become a humble spiritual congregation, it starts with each person understanding what it means to work out our salvation with fear and trembling while God works in us to will and to act according to his good purpose and pleasure. Does that demonstrate, does that reflect your life right now? If we gather together and that's where we're going, we're going to become a holy and a humble spiritual congregation. What about healthy? Holy, these are, we usually say holy, healthy, humble, but healthy shows up third here. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now comes the healthy spiritual community. You ready for it? Everybody say amen. amen. Do all things. How many things? All. How many things? All. Oh boy, we're all going to get in trouble here. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. All things. We are to be a healthy spiritual community, which means no complaining no contending, no grumbling, no rumbling. None of it. Well, guess how many churches fail this? All of them. Christians struggle with attitude problems. Am I right? 
I struggle with bad attitudes, and everyone else does as well. That's why we have to be exhorted. That's why we have to be reminded. We are to become a healthy, healthy spiritual community, not toxic, not selfish, not divided. Who wants to come to a church that's at war with God or with each other? We've all been through church fights, am I right? Churches can fight. So we have to prioritize becoming healthier. We're going to descend into grumbling and rumbling and complaining and contending. This is something that takes intentionality because our default setting is usually to be discouraged. And therefore we can slip into becoming complainers and then contenders and then grumblers and rumblers. So we, I like what W.C. Fields said. He said, start off every day with a smile and get it over with. <laughs> Captures our inherent tendency to not stay happy. So we have to have a vision for the health of our congregation. We're called children of God. That identity is where our love for one another comes from. Well, I'll talk to her when she starts being nice again. No, you'll talk to her because she's your sister in Christ and you're going to be together forever. I think God's probably going to put your mansion next to your worst Christian enemy in heaven so you guys can work it out. Better if you arrive with it sorted through. Okay, we are, here's my point, and this is a little ecclesiology here. We don't create Christian unity. The Spirit does that. We are one in Christ. Because we're children of God, if we don't learn to work it out together, we are grieving the Spirit of God, and we are straining a reality that is unbreakable. Imagine taking two cats, tying them by the tail. Oh, they're united. But are they happy about it? Now throw them over a clothesline and see what happens. Here's my point. We are united. What we do with that fact is going to either glorify or grieve a holy God. So how are we doing at creating healthy spiritual community? That's what we should be pursuing and it says here that we are to do all things without grumbling or disputing. Verse 15, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. We are to avoid complaining and contending. I want to reference Deuteronomy 32 and 33 because this is coming out of a community that just got done with 40 years in the penalty box under God's judgment. Moses wrote a song. It's his swan song. God gave it to him. He shared it with the Israelites, and Deuteronomy 32 is a song. And Moses says this, I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. There's worship. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Verse 5, they, they, though, have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children, because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Do you see how Philippians came straight from that? These, these are the Israelites who fell away from They're a crooked and twisted generation. It says in verse 6, Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is it not He, your Father, who created you, who made you and established you? So the idea here is that the children rejected the Father who made them spiritually. So I got a phone call from my daughter this week, and I picked up. And she said, Dad, you're fired as my father. I said, what? She said, you put a video of me on TikTok, didn't you? I said, yes. <laughs> she had just come back from the dentist. Half of her face was numb. It was hilarious. I threw it straight on TikTok. She goes, you're fired as my father. We made up. Hey, that's what's happening in Deuteronomy 32. They fired God as, his, as their father. And they're being warned not to follow that wicked, crooked generation. Deuteronomy 33 says it wonderfully. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. This is Paul's heart for the church. Who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. Now get along as children of God. Get along with God and get along with each other. That's what it means to be healthy. 
So we have holy, humble, healthy. This is the vision. In here, we're becoming a holy, healthy, humble spiritual community. Jot this down. Now, looking back and ahead at Anchor in here, I just have some brief highlights. How are we striving to become a, a spiritual community? There's only two points to this sermon. That's why we're staying on this point a little longer. But, of course, we went through the series, The Emotionally Healthy Church. Here's a picture of that. And we really tried to zero in on how we can become emotionally devoted to the Lord individually and as a church. That whole series is available online. There's one way in God's Word. Every Sunday we said, Lord, make us a healthy church. We also did a church survey. 73% of our people who took the survey said they do feel connected in community. That's wonderful, but that means there's still 27% of people who would be members or regular attenders who still are trying to get connected, and we want to help you this fall. So we are striving to become an emotionally healthy church together. As we look ahead, the strategic plan, here's another um, list of those. We have number five is a healthy community plan. Soul care, correction, conflict resolution. We will cultivate a holy, mature, loving community. So there's many different things as you read the strategic plan that you'll see, but this fall we're doing a small group series. It's called Experiencing God. Henry Blackaby, they've kind of revamped the thing. It, was, it went viral before things could go viral back in the uh, 2000s. So we're going to do Experiencing God as our small group curriculum. We're excited about that. Uh, ABI is going to study the Holy Spirit and the church, ecclesiology, Monday nights, men's, women's Bible studies are getting ready to launch. We've got a parents class we're going to offer this fall. These are just a few highlights of the ways that we are striving to become a holy, healthy, humble spiritual community in here. Now that's the first goal. Now the second goal, jot this down, is out there. Out there, we're reaching half a million people in 40 cities over the next thousand days for the glory of Christ. Out there, we're reaching half a million people in 40 cities over the next thousand days for the glory of Christ. Paul starts to talk about out there in verse 15. He says that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. It's a picture. It's a picture of the church Look, look, we're striving to become holy, healthy, humble in here. Then we go out there, and it doesn't say shine as if we have to start trying. It says you, you will, you do shine. People are already going to see whatever it is that you're becoming. And then once you're out there, you're shining like stars, like lights in the night sky. So what are people seeing as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? They are watching you. You know that, right? You know your non-Christian family members are watching you, right? You know your non-Christian co-workers are watching you. You know that, right? You know you're showing them everything you think about Christianity. Mark Twain said, few things are harder to put up with than a good example. They're watching you. And they're watching you in part because they don't have what you do. Here's a picture of Earth. And there is a darkness that falls over the whole world. The sun goes down, and that sense of darkness is God's spiritual es estimation of humanity. It's dark. It's very dark, and it needs light. Spiritually, people are in darkness, and men love darkness, and that's why we are the city on a hill. Jesus said, you are, you are let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify God. We are a light. We are a light. We don't become a light. We are a light. People are going to see how we're living and what we're saying. We are to show it and tell it. We hold out the word of life. That's the gospel truth specifically, but also the whole word of God, the whole counsel of God, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. The gospel of Jesus Christ, there's synonyms there. And we're either holding fast to it, which means we're not letting it go or abandoning it, or we're holding it out, which means we're not hiding it. So as a church, we don't cover God's word. We don't cave from God's word. We, we don't cover it. We don't cave from it. We hold out the word of life. We hold fast to the word of life that the world may see the light, the truth of the gospel in our faces. Out there, we're reaching a dark world. It's a twisted generation. There's only two groups before God. 
Those on the wide road, those on the narrow road. Those going to heaven, those going to hell. There is no in-between. And those of us going to heaven have to reach out to those who are going to hell as lights in the darkness. We have to show it, and we have to tell it. It says here, among whom you shine like lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, well, what's that? That is judgment day. That's the day when Christ returns. You will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the life you've lived in the body. Paul wants to be proud that he didn't run or labor in vain. He's looking ahead to that day like he's running and he wants you to run in a way to win. Obviously, Philippians has some famous passages about that, pressing on to take hold of that, right? Running in a manner. So we're running to cross the finish line to be awarded by the judge. The Olympics, of course, just happened. Here's a picture of the medal. It was just beautiful. They, put, they built a piece of the Eiffel Tower from previous renovations into the gold medals. Isn't that cool? So there's a piece of the city in the gold given to the victors. And here's a picture of the planning committee as they were getting everything ready. They're holding the medals out. Before everyone showed up, they've got the medals ready. They prepared the medals. And then the judges were all going to show up. That's an idea of what it means to cross over into the next life. The day of Christ is coming. Are you ready for that? Romans 2.16 says, On that day God will judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Oh, there will be a judge, and it's Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8 says, We are waiting for the revealing of the Lord Jesus, who will sustain us to the end, I love this, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only hope you have of crossing the finish line and standing before the judge guiltless is if the judge saved your soul from hell forever. Is that your hope? Are you looking forward to standing in front of God? Look, if when you stand before a holy God on judgment day, your speech begins with, I'm a pretty good person. Uh, you're, you fell off the beam, my friend. You're not going to heaven because good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. Have you received the glory of salvation? Paul wants you to get across the finish line like him so that he hasn't run or labored for nothing. He's striving to cross the finish line. And this all happens when you receive the word of life. You believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's your only hope for getting into heaven. Is that your hope? He wants you to be guiltless in the day of Christ. So we know that we have to get out there. We have to share the gospel. We've got a, a map here that we use to show our mission field. I'm going to slide it to the front here. And when we launched our vision, we realized we put all of our people on the map. Here's all the dots. Here's where all of you live. And we have about a seven-mile radius from Anchor Church. We found out through technology that uh, half a million people live in this circle with where, where we all are. We call this Anchor Lake. <laughs> and we are to be fishing for souls in Anchor Lake. We desperately want God to use us to reach all half a million people with the gospel. Yes, we've got our eye on the surrounding regions too. But these are souls that need to be saved. We're holding out the word of life. And so jot this down, looking back and looking ahead. How is Anchor Church getting out there? Looking back and looking ahead. We have a passion for people who don't know Jesus. In our church survey, 70% of our congregation this year said they have invited somebody to church. Praise God. If you've invited somebody to church, that's awesome. But there's 30% of our church, when we took our survey, that still hasn't even invited one person to church this year. Wouldn't you love at the end of the year to do that survey again to say 100% of our people invited somebody to church this year? Wouldn't you love to be included in that? It's not a high bar to hit, to at least invite one person to church a year, and I think you could do a lot more than that. So we have a passion for people who don't know Jesus. Praise God, we have a willingness. According to our survey, over 50% of our people said they want to serve in the community or to share their faith, and 40% said that they really desire to go on a mission trip. I'm not surprised, Pastor Bob, that Andre said this is the biggest group, 18, that's ever come from a church. Our people said it on the survey. We, we want to get out there, you know. That's showing up now. That's a healthy heart to say, let's get out there. 
Yes, in the church, let's be holy, healthy, humble, but let's get out there and share the word of life. And guess what? Maybe you're discouraged because you can't control the results. I tried. I tried to share my faith with my family, and they just don't want to hear about it. Verse 17, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. In the Old Testament, a drink offering, you walked up to the altar and you spilled it on the ground. Paul's like, even if, even if that's a summary, meaning he thought he could die. He thought his life is about to be spilled out, or he's wasting his time on the church because they're not going to listen to him. Either way, even if what I'm doing on you is I'm just spilling myself on the ground, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. You don't care about the results. You just leave that with God. You're just pouring yourself out because you know that it's an offering to a holy God, and it doesn't matter what he does with it. That's the heart of why we reach out. We've reached out with the word of God. We did, here's a picture of conversation killers. Uh, yeah, here's the next one. We did conversation killers and apologetic series over the summer. We want to help you to have great spiritual conversations. And here's a bit of an older picture with how we were getting out there in community. Um, we're getting out there serving, and you saw some of those in the recap video as well. So we want to get out there ahead. And I put this on Facebook, but we also want to directly share the gospel. So if you're not doing anything tomorrow, come here. We're leaving church at 11 a.m., and we're going down to Chicago because the Democratic National Convention is in town. Uh, 100,000 visitors are coming to Chicago. Oh, it's going to get rowdy. We're hoping to be in and out before it gets rowdy. But uh, we're not going to the convention grounds. We're going to the Bean and the Fountain, and we're just going to hand out Find God Again material. And if you can do this, then you can come play a part. You can just hand out material if you want, or you can have spiritual conversations. But we're leaving the church at 11, and then from noon uh, to 2, we're going to just tell people about Jesus, hand out material, and then we're going to come back before 3. So be here tomorrow if you want to go and share your faith with other people. This is our way of trying to get out there. If going downtown during the Democratic National Convention freaks you out, we will also be going to the Taste of Chicago. So you can pick a tastier opportunity in the future if you would rather do that. Or you could do both. All right. Well, I have one last thing to do. And we're at the halfway point of our thousand-day vision. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up here. So worship team, come on back up here as we're about to sing our last song. And you guys might need to move the map. <laughs> but um, you haven't missed it. If you weren't around when we started the Thousand Day Vision and you want to be on mission for Christ, it, it doesn't even matter if you're from out of town. You could be here from Nebraska. I don't care. But we give, when we give an update, we give everyone the chance to say, I want, I want, I want to commit to saying, God, use me. Wherever I am, use me. I, I want to become somebody who's helping the church become holy, healthy, humble, but I want to get out there and I want to share the gospel or be a good example to my neighbor, to my coworker, to my family. I don't know what it looks like for you, but God has works for you to do. So if you have not gotten a ribbon yet, uh, whether you're a part of this church or not, we give you an opportunity when we give this update to say, Isaiah 6, 8, here I am, send me. And then you take this home and you put it somewhere where you remember it, and for the next 500 days, you say, God, use me. Use me. So this is your chance to respond to what you just heard. If you have not, how many of you have gotten a ribbon? Raise your hand if you've already got your ribbon. Okay, if you lost your ribbon, don't come up. Find me after, and I'll give you another one. But if you've never gotten a ribbon, I want you to stand up right now and come down as your way of saying, God, send me, use me, wherever it is, whatever it is. Come up right now, grab your ribbon, and this is your way of saying, Lord, I'm responding. I want you to use me. Come on up. I want you to send me. Come on up and grab it. Put it in a place where you won't forget it. All right? There you go. Now just wait just for a second because we've got to say it together. We're going to say Isaiah 6, 8 together. Here you go. Um, doesn't matter where you're from. This is just your way of saying, okay, God, use me. Use me however you can. Now, come on. You can't leave yet. Just get in line. We've got to say it together. Okay? Who else? Coming on up. This is your way of committing to saying, I'm going to go. Come on up, little guy. There you go. There you go. All right, now hold on. You got to wait. You got to say it. You got to say it. All right, ready? Your line is on the ribbon, but you're going to say Isaiah 6 8 together. Your line is here I am, send me. Okay, so hold up the ribbon. Hold it up. And now listen, God's going to use you. All right? 
He's got work for you to do, and you're committing to that right now. So on the count of three, we're going to say it. Ready? One, two, three. Here I am, send me. Let's give these folks a round of applause. All right, you got to be seated.